All right, well, today's the day of what I believe is going to be a really excellent journey for us. It's called the 90-day faith lift. Now, I said faith lift. I wasn't lifting, okay? I really meant what I said. The 90-day faith lift. This is the beginning of a 90-day study on the application of God's Word concerning the subject of faith. Now, you might say, I've read a lot of books on faith, and I've heard a thousand messages on faith, and so everything you've got to say, I've probably already heard. Well, I want to tell you something. I guarantee you're going to hear some stuff you've never heard before. That might scare you, <laughs> but it's okay. As long as it's found, its foundation is in the Word of God. As long as you check it out with the Word of God, and the Word of God bears witness to it, then it's a great thing, Lord. Bring it on. Bring it on. So I'm going to give you a promise, but you must be willing to do your part. If you will listen carefully to the words that the Lord has given me to give to you for the next 90 days, and if you will make an effort to apply them to your life, then you will definitely be changed at the end of these 90 days. You will not be the same. Your walk with God will not be the same. It cannot remain the same if you apply what is given problem with most diets is that every other day will not work. You've got to be consistent at it. Every other day, I, you know, I know people that have been on, who knows, hundreds of diets. Well, that diet didn't work for me. Well, a lot of the times when, when a person says diet didn't work for them, it means they did not stick to the diet for the period of time that was specified. A lot of people want instant results, and they want that with their faith as well. Instant results. I just, you know, I got heard one sermon and boom, I'm filled for the rest of my life with faith. It's amazing, right? It doesn't really work that way. You have to apply these things to your life. Every other day doesn't work. When it comes to diets, you're going to find no matter what the, you know, the special little pill says, you just take the pill and there's no exercise. Well, that's a diet that doesn't work. That's a diet that will lighten your wallet of cash, not your belly of fat. Okay. So, for this program to work, every other day won't work. You have to begin to apply these things to your life every day. The simple physics of dieting is this. The more calories you take in, the more you will have to burn for you to end up with a deficit to lose weight. You know, if you take in more than you burn, then you're going to gain weight. If you take in less than you burn, you're going to lose weight. Isn't that right? All right, so you have to stick to the program. The problem lies in people getting to the point of being able to commit to the diet. Now, you're probably working on your spiritual growth right now, and you've probably been working on it for years if you've been saved for a while, and yet with limited results. You know, if diets worked, if each diet worked, then, then how come people, the next time they gain weight, they switch to a different diet? You ever notice that? They don't go, that diet works, that's the one I've stuck to. No, they try the next one and the next one and the next one because the one that was previous didn't quite satisfy what they were looking for. Because what a lot of people are looking for is instant results. Instant results. That's magic, isn't it? Okay, so now it's time to look at all those lost years we've had of fooling around with magic pills and programs and positive thinking that have really accomplished very little toward our spiritual advancement. Now is the time to commit to a measly 90 days to change your life forever and to grow spiritually like you've never grown before. Are you willing to do that? 90 days. That means if you come every other week, probably the diet won't work. Because you see, each thing that I will teach during each week will be a building block. And if you want to end up with the whole house at the end of the thing, you've got to come for each block. Isn't that right? Otherwise, you have holes in your building. Well, like a diet, you have to stick to this. This isn't going to be a diet that's all fat, no carbs. It's not going to be a water diet. It's going to be a diet that is uh, based on the real, nutritious Word of God, which will spiritually build you up. It's not going to be a diet made of pre-made frozen meals that give you half as much food and charge you twice as much. <laughs> that's the way you lose the weight. They give you a tiny meal, and then you've got to eat two of the things, right? Okay, it's not going to be one of those. But the food, as you will learn, will be of a flavor you've probably never tasted before. The Lord has spoken to me in prayer recently some dynamic things about the workings of faith that I've never heard preached before. Now, I've heard a lot preached about faith. 
I've been saved at least 35 years, I suppose. It may scare you when I say these are things you haven't heard before. You might say, well, you know, that's the way heresies come about. Somebody gets some new revelation and then they're off, you know, teaching all kinds of weird stuff. Well, heresies only survive when people don't compare what is being said to what the Word of God already says. Isn't that right? Okay. So I won't have you turn here. I'll just read it for you. Acts 17.11 talks about a church, the Berean church, that Paul went and preached to. And as he preached to the Berean church, he preached some stuff they had never heard, which had to do with Jesus Christ. But here's what it says. I'll reach the NIV version in this case. It says, Now the Bereans were more noble in character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see whether what Paul said was true. Well, you see, you can hear something new and say, well, I've never heard that, so I'm not accepting that. No, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to hear what you hear today. If it's new to you, compare it to the Word of God. And if it lines up with the Word of God, then you need to swallow it, right? Because this is the food that you need to grow. So are you ready for this amazing journey? Are you ready for it? Are you ready? Bring it on. All right, I love it. All right. All right. Then let's talk about faith. Now, we need to answer several questions about faith before we can properly move on and apply it to our lives. Now, I want to say one thing, too, is in the Old Testament times, there were times where the children of Israel backslid, and the temple fell into disrepair, right? And what you would have to do before you could reinstitute the temple sacrifice and do things the way they were supposed to be, the first thing you had to do was remove the rubble, remove the refuse from the temple, clean it out. The next thing was not only removing the rubble, removing the idols that were in the temple before it could be put to God's use again. Well, some things we're going to learn today are things we need to take out of our life so that we can build the proper foundation of faith. There's some things you're going to have to unlearn because they've been learned wrong. There's some things that are obstacles to our faith, and if we don't take them out of the way, we can't build the proper foundation for faith. So here's some things, some questions about faith that we need to ask before, or we need, yeah, we'll need to cover uh, concerning the subject of faith. First of all, what is faith? We're going to have to cover that. We're going to have to give definitions for faith along the way. How does faith work? How can I get faith? What should we put our faith in? What are the obstacles to faith, which we're going to talk about one of those today? Who's authorized to use this faith that the Bible talks about? What gives faith its power? Why does our faith not always work? That's a good question, isn't it? How many of you have faith that has always worked? Nobody. Wow, well, we need to ask ourselves, why didn't it work? These are a few questions we need to address, and we will. Now, you may have heard all kinds of things about faith, but you still have inconsistent results. Inconsistent results. We want our faith to be dependable. We don't want our faith to be like, you know, like a British sports car. You put the key in, you turn the key, you pray, you hope something happens. Undependable. We need faith that is dependable. How really important is faith? Let's turn to Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. All right. In this case, I'll give the NIV version. It says this, and without faith, that's the thing we're talking about, it is impossible to please God. Well, that seems like that's a pretty important thing because I want to please God. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that earnestly seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Is that important to you? We're all, we all call ourselves Christians. Hopefully, we want to please God. Without faith, it's not possible. So we want to have that faith, that kind of faith that the Bible talks about. Hebrews 6.12, uh, I'll just read that for you. You don't have to turn there. It says this. We do not want to be lazy, but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, have inherited the promises. The Word of God is full of promises, and if you want to be able to attain those in your life, to obtain those promises for yourself, it says it's through faith and patience. Without faith, you can't get what God has promised you. 
The promises are all sitting on the shelf, but you can't reach the shelf, right? How important is faith? Well, first of all, I need faith to please God. Second of all, I need faith to be able to even obtain His promises. That seems pretty important for me. I'll read you another scripture. You don't have to turn there. James 1, 5 through 7. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Listen to this. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Wait a minute. Now, I can ask in faith, but if my faith is wavering, I'm not to expect anything back. Is your faith ever shaky? Have you ever had shaky faith? Have you ever asked something and then you were all full of questions? I don't know if he's going to do it. I don't know if it's going to come to pass. I don't know if that's for me. I don't know if that's for today. All those questions you have that cause your faith to shake. Sometimes our faith is shaky. How can we get the shakes out of our faith? We're going to learn some ways to get the shakes out of our faith. Here's another fact we need to know. There's different kinds of faith. There is a faith that's given to everybody that walks the face of the earth, and that's the faith to be saved. It comes from God. He gives saving faith to anybody who is willing to use it. Anybody who's willing to say yes and respond to the gospel, they've got enough faith to do it. God gave it to them. But it takes different kinds of faith to do different things. There's a kind of faith that is for those who are going to lay hands on the sick and believe that they will be healed and recover. There's a kind of faith that has to do with the working of miracles or praying for things that are far beyond the norm. There's all kinds of faith. The Bible says you can have all faith, but if you don't apply it correctly, there's no profit in it. We want to learn to exercise our faith according to how the Word says to exercise it, so that it will be effective, so that our prayers will not be in vain, so that what we pray for actually will come to pass. And when you, when you get what you pray for, when it comes to pass as you prayed for it, you'll find your faith will get greater. The problem is many people have asked incorrectly so many times and have had, been disappointed so many times that their faith has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. If you do it wrong, you're going to get the wrong results. We need to learn how to do it right. We want to have all the kinds of faith that the Bible offers us, don't we? We don't want to pick and choose. Well, I like that kind, but not this kind. You know, there's some churches you can go to, and they, they will talk to you about the faith for salvation, but they'll say, the faith for healing, that's not for today. You know what? If the Bible teaches it, I want all of it. I want every bit of it. Now, when you have prayed and not gotten the results that you wanted, and you thought you prayed in faith, and you thought you put all your might into it, and you, you thought you based it on the Word of God, and you did everything the right way, and you didn't get what you wanted, no doubt after that you start to examine, what did I do wrong? What did I do that caused this not to work out the way it's supposed to work out, the way the Bible says it's supposed to work out? So you go down your checklist, and the first thing you got on your checklist is probably, first of all, do I believe that God can do this? That's not usually our problem, is it? We believe God can do anything He wants, don't we? Most of us do. That's really not the problem. If you don't believe God can do it, why would you even ask Him? But we ask, believing He can do it, He's able. Number two, do I believe that God has expressed this desire that I'm, I'm seeking to be fulfilled? Has He expressed it in His Word that it's a promise somewhere I can find to say, I base this request on something that's promised. In other words, can you ask for things that the Bible has never promised you? Well, it's so much better to ask based on what the Word says. If God has promised you something, you can ask Him in faith, and you should expect to receive it. So we say, did we base our request on the promises of God? And many times we'll go, yeah, that wasn't the problem. Perhaps the next thing on our list, perhaps the quality of our faith wasn't strong enough. Perhaps our faith was shaky. Perhaps we, we asked a God that we, knows, we know can do it. We asked him based on his word, but our faith kind of went, eh, I don't know if he's going to do it. I'm not sure. Shaky faith. So sometimes the answer is, yeah, my faith was kind of shaky. And if that's true, then we assume it was the strength of my faith that failed me in this case. 
But what if we believed with all of our might? We really did. We didn't shake. And what if we declared it to be done by faith, speaking words of faith over it? And still, to our surprise, nothing happened. Then what do you look at? What's the problem? That is when we begin to look at ourselves and we decide that maybe it's something to do with me. Maybe I don't deserve it. Maybe it's because I haven't been as prayerful as I should have been. Or maybe God has promised that to some people, but he didn't promise it to me. We ask those kinds of questions, and we end up undermining our own faith. It's easy for me to say, I know God is able to do it. I know God has promised it. But it's just as easy to say, but I'm not sure he's going to do it for me right now when I pray. Huh? When you pray, do you ever pray? Okay, I'm believing. Yes, sister, you're, you're sick, and I'm going to pray for your healing, but I'm going to believe in faith, but I'm really not sure God wants to do it today. Do you pray like that? We've got to get those bugs out of our faith so it can work. And then we ask, why would he do it for me? I don't deserve it. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe he's not pleased with me. And, and, and so I'm not really confident that I can ask and he would give. Now I want you to turn to a scripture in 1 John 5.14. 1 John 5.14. And we're going to read verses 14 and 15. Pay close attention to these verses. It says this, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Right? right? So we have confidence because we're asking according to His will. How do we know it's according to His will? Well, one of the ways is, does His Word say He's promised us this thing? Has his word given us this promise? If so, we can say, it's in his word. It's according to his will. I have no problem with that. So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Next verse. And if we know that he hears us, we know he's heard us, then whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. The scripture says a whole lot. First of all, we have faith or confidence approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, or in other words, according to his word, that he will hear our prayers. And when we know that he's heard our prayers, we know that he'll grant us whatever we have asked of him. Is that the way you read that? Is that the way you understand that? Now, with that knowledge, here's a new question for you that you've got to ask yourself. Is God hearing my prayers? The scripture says, if we know he hears us, we know we will receive it. The question is, does he really hear us? You might say, well, God can hear everything. It's not a matter of hearing you audibly. It has to do with this. In the, if you take a case to the Supreme Court, they decide whether they will hear the case or not before they put it in the courtroom. They look at the case and go, this is a frivolous lawsuit. We're not even going to listen to it. They throw it out. You're looking to get a hearing from the judge. Well, there's some things God will not hear because somehow we've disqualified ourselves from being able to approach Him. So God, sometimes, as we pray, He doesn't hear what we're saying. You say, but I'm a Christian. He hears everything I say. Well, you're incorrect. He doesn't hear everything you say because the Word tells us what He does listen to. There are sometimes we pray and God says, I'm not listening. Is that possible? It's scriptural. God's hearing has nothing to do with audible sound. It has everything to do with the condition of your heart as you pray. Now, we'll discover some very important things about faith that are crucial for you to see your faith actually work in your life. A few of these crucial elements that we will talk about in the next few weeks are these three things. If you do not have these three things in their proper place and functioning, your faith doesn't work, believe it or not. Grace is one of the words. You won't know right now how that applies, but we'll get to that next week. Mercy is another word. You don't know right now how that applies, but if it's not working properly in your life, your faith won't work. And the other third word is humility. This is the word we're going to talk about today. 
It's easy to say, it's a simple deduction if you say, well, that car doesn't run because it doesn't have an engine. Well, if it doesn't have an engine, of course it's not going to run. But we could be more specific than that, and we could say, if the engine itself doesn't have all of its individual parts functioning, the engine won't run either, right? You say, well, that car's got an engine, it ought to run. No, if it has no spark plugs, even though it's got an engine, it will not run. If it has no fuel pump, even though it's got spark plugs and everything else, it will not run. Everything, every component of the engine has to be working properly for the engine to run, for the car to move, doesn't it? You say, I've got faith. Well, you've got the engine, but does your engine have all of its components working properly? Because if they are not all working properly together, faith will not start. It will not work. Without faith, you can't receive anything from God. That's what the Bible says. Without faith, it's impossible. For faith to work, you must have all the elements of grace, mercy, and humility functioning properly in your life. Otherwise, your faith will take you nowhere. Now, I'll give you the first example as we talk about the role of humility in faith. Without humility, your faith cannot work. Why not, you might be asking. All right, well, we just read a verse in 1 John 5 that said this. It said, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. For our faith-filled request to be answered, it must first be heard. And if God will not hear it, we will not receive it. And why would God not hear us? I'll give you a few reasons why he would not hear us. You do not have to turn there, but Psalm 66, 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, another version says this. If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What God looks at every time you pray is the attitude of your heart. If there is some secret sin in your life, some sin that's a pet sin, something that you say, I don't want to get rid of this, I like this, I enjoy this, he says, I can't hear you. We're not talking about a sin that you're trying to overcome, and by his grace, he's helping you through that. We're talking about a sin that you refuse to address. If you refuse to address sin, God says, I can't hear you, but I'm praying really loud. He says, you can pray as loud as you want. I'm not giving you a hearing. And if I don't hear you, you can be sure I'm not answering your request. Do you get that? Your heart, the condition of your heart has everything to do with your approaching God and being heard. You may say, well, I'm saved. I live a straight life. I haven't done a lot of bad things. I'm better than most people. God hates sin, but at the top of his list of his hated sins is the sin of pride. That's at the top of the list. Proverbs 16.5 says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Wow, an abomination? Do you know there are some Christians that are proud of heart? Wow, that's just such a strange combination. You mean I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm accepted in the beloved, but I'm an abomination to the Lord? That just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fit, does it? It says that the proud in heart are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16.18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, I would like you to turn to James 4, 6. James 4, 6. If we walk in pride, God does not hear our prayer. If God does not hear our prayer, God does not answer our prayer. We know if he hears us, he answers but he will not give everybody a hearing. James 4, 6 says this. But he gives more grace. Wherefore, the scripture saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. All right. Can you imagine being successful at any endeavor in life if God is resisting you? Is there anything you can do if God's against you? Is there anything you can accomplish, any ground you can cover and move forward and progress in if God says, I'm against you? It's impossible. It's impossible. Now, what does it say also in this, in this uh, verse? It says, but he gives grace to the humble. Do you know what? I'm not perfect yet, and neither are you. I'm just taking a guess, but I'd probably think you're not. And because I'm not perfect, if I come to God with a proud heart, he says, well, I'm not even listening. 
But if I come to God with a humble heart, it says he gives me grace, which means this. The fact you're not perfect, I accept you as you are, even though you don't meet up just yet, because you're humble. If God accepts the humble and he gives them grace, he listens to them, he will answer your prayers. If we come to God in humility, he will listen and give grace where we come short. God resists the proud. He's not for them. He's against them. It doesn't matter how righteously they are outwardly. God resists them. On the other hand, the humble, he generously gives to them because he listens to their prayers because of their humility. They may not even be living a perfect life just yet, but that's where grace comes into play. He says, I accept you because of your heart. You're not perfect yet, but I'm working on you. And you're humble, so I can work on you. And because you're humble, I can put grace in the equation. And where you fall short, grace will fill up where you fall short. It'll pay that part you can't pay. Here is a perfect biblical example of this in action. Let's turn to Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Now, Jesus sees the Pharisees, and he often, you know, he often gives jabs to the Pharisees because the Pharisees were the religious leaders of their time, and the Pharisees walked around with an air of pride and arrogance. And the Pharisees wore the finest clothes, and the Pharisees did prayers in the marketplace so everybody could hear how holy they were. And the Pharisees did a lot of stuff for show, and God says, that's a nice show, but I'm not watching it. So Jesus tells about a situation with a Pharisee and the lowest of low lives, a tax collector. Okay? That's still the case today. But Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Well, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed to himself. Isn't that wonderful? He prayed to himself. You know, if you're praying to yourself, then I guess self is going to have to answer the prayer. Right? But he prayed to himself. Why? Because God resists the proud. He says, I'm not listening, so you're praying to yourself. So it says the Pharisee stood up and he prayed to himself. I don't know why he even bothered going to church to pray for himself. He could have done that at home. It says, he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I'm not a robber or an evildoer or an adulterer or even like this tax collector, this low life. He says, I fast twice a week. I do a whole lot. I give a whole lot of money, too. He says, he says I give a tenth of all that I get. I'm a big contributor to your work. But the tax collector, to collector stood at a distance. He stood in the back of the room of the temple because he said, I'm not even worthy to come up front. He stood at a distance, and he would not even look up to heaven. He wouldn't even raise his head because of shame. He wasn't proud of who he was. He was humble. But he beat his breast, and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What was he asking God for when he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner? He was asking for mercy, not because he deserved anything. Simply, he was saying, I come to you with nothing to pay the price for this mercy I'm asking for. I'm asking it based on your mercy. Would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? just because of mercy, right? That's what he's asking for. The 14th verse, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Wait a minute. He was justified? What does that mean? God heard his prayer. God heard the prayer of the tax collector, but he didn't hear the prayer of the Pharisee. It says, uh, he went home justified before God, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, the tax collector humbled himself, and he prayed to God instead of to self. And he depended on God, and his faith was solely based on God's mercy, not his good works. And Jesus said that man was justified. So in other words, he came in as an unjust sinner. He left as a justified man, all based on what? A humble prayer asking for God's mercy. I want you to notice this too. The tax collector appeared to pray with great faith. He knew he had a right to be there. 
I have a right to address God and get what I'm asking for. But he got nothing. So great faith had nothing to do with it. The tax collector came in there with no faith. I don't even know if I'm worthy to even ask this, but if you have just some mercy for me, I'd, I'd love to receive that. Would you please see if in your, in your goodness you could forgive me? Wasn't a lot of faith, but God answered that prayer. What made the difference? Where mercy's involved in it, where humility's involved in it, you know what? Uh, your faith, even though shaky, God receives it because of that to your heart. You come in so proud, I've got all this powerful faith, and I can pray for everybody, and they're all healed instantly. You'll find many of the faith healers of the 50s had, in the beginnings, great ministries that actually had documented, proved healings. And you find when they got big enough and famous enough, it was a lot of talk, a lot of prayer, and nothing happening. Why? Because after a while, if men think the power is because of something they've done and start to say, I've got all this faith, I've got all this power, suddenly God says, well, I'm pulling the plug on you because I resist the proud. And I'm not listening to you as long as you think it's you because it isn't you, it's me. When they were humble in their beginnings, God heard them and their prayers were answered. The Pharisee prayed to himself. What a waste of time that is. Now, here's a story that I think will help you to remember this important lesson. All right, one, now, I, Ben's got even a graphic, I think, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, did you ever see the movie Shrek? Okay. Patrick loves that movie. The donkey. There's the donkey. The donkey's a player in this story. All right, so it's, it's about the donkey. But anyway, one afternoon, all the barnyard animals came together, and they reported on all the things that they had accomplished that day. So the rooster said, I was the first one up this morning, and I crowed to let everybody know it was time to go to work. How about that? Well, the hen stood up and said, well, I provided eggs this morning so that the farmer and his family could have nourishment so they could go to work. How about that? Well, the cow stood up, and he says, well, I provided the farmer's family and his cat with milk and milk so that they could also make butter and be able to sell it and make a living. How about that? Then they turned to the donkey and said, so what did you do today? Well, the donkey didn't give milk. He didn't lay an egg. Well, the donkey was grinning from ear to ear. He's gone. Donkey was grinning from ear to ear. There he is. Yeah. And he said, it was amazing. This was the greatest day of my whole life. I was working downtown today in Jerusalem. And as I walked through the streets, an enormous crowd gathered around me. And they threw palm fronds at my feet. And they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. It was the greatest day of my whole life. The problem is the donkey forgot who was riding on his back. We can think we're such a big deal, you forget who's the one who is the power that empowers you to do whatever you do. If you take the credit, you've missed the message. If you do not have humility to give all glory to God, then you put somebody else on the throne and you exalt self. And the scripture says plainly that God humbles those that exalt themselves and he exalts those that humble themselves. Your faith, no matter how powerful it is, no matter how unshaking it is, no matter how based on the word it is, will not work if you're operating in pride. It just will not work. Why? Because God says, I will not listen to you. And not only will I not listen to you, I will resist you. I don't want God resisting me. You know, you can even have pride in small things, in subtle ways, and you have to just watch the way you think. You could have pride, for example. Here's a subtle way you could have pride. You could have pride in the church you go to. You could say, I'm proud that I go to a church that believes in prayer and believes in faith and not one of those weak churches that doesn't believe in that stuff. I'm glad I go to a church that believes in divine healing and not one of those other churches like down the street where they don't even believe for that stuff. I'm glad I go to a church where the people give in tithes and offerings generously. You don't have to beg them. And not that other church which is just they're faltering and falling apart. You can get proud about anything. Well, you know what? The fact that you come to a church that you love and is a good church, that's a gift from God to you. 
It's not because you are so great. It's not because of anything you did. And wherein there, the Bible says, wherein therefore is the boasting? Our boasting is in God, not in ourselves. If you go to a good church, boast in God. Thank God for what he's done. You say, our church doesn't have any phony hypocrites like all those other churches. Well, praise God, that's, that's his doing, not yours. Okay? All right. Satan became the enemy of God when pride entered his heart. It was pride that separated Satan from his high exalted position in God's kingdom. Satan, before he fell, was an exalted angel who had a fantastic position. In fact, he was God's right-hand man, so to speak. He was the leader of the heavenly worship team, you know. But Satan allowed pride to enter into his heart, and God said, I'm casting you out of my presence. You've allowed iniquity to enter your heart. Jesus did not come to restore Satan's position. He came to destroy him. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The first work of the devil was pride. The first sin that was committed was pride. The sin that's at the top of God's seven deadly sin list is pride. He hates pride. The same sin that separated Satan from God is the first place that Satan uh, used to work on man to get man to fall. Man's pride. He first worked on man. You know, if you eat of this thing, you'll be like God yourself. Oh, well, that would be great. I'd be God. I wouldn't need him. Man's fall came beginning with pride. Pride is something that separates you from God. You can be a Christian and full of pride, and you know what? God says he resists you. That's a separation, isn't it? Do you not want God on your side? Do you not want God to hear your prayers? Do you not want God to say, I am listening. Whatever you ask in my name, I will give it. We have to get pride out of the way. Pride is a delicious sin. It feels good. The self loves to be stroked. After all, there's some of us who, you know, didn't have the best of lives when we were little kids and, and people made us feel small and insignificant, but pride makes me feel you're special, you're smart. Yeah, well, yeah, some people are very special. So I'm special, I'm smart, I'm wise, I'm beautiful, and all, everybody's so lucky to have me here. That's pride. It is the grace of God that gave you anything you have. God wants us to be without rival in our heart when it comes to his affection. There is a throne in the heart, and that throne, upon that throne can be seated an idol or self or Jesus Christ. You're the one who chooses. If we think we're so wonderful and everybody's so lucky to have us around, we have put self on the throne of the heart. And God is a jealous God, and he's not willing to share his glory with any other, the Bible says. Idolatry is something that God hates. One of the things I began this message with was this. If you want to restore the temple, you've got to take the rubble out, and you've got to take the idols down. The idol that we need to address before faith can operate in our lives is the idol of pride and self-arrogance. We are nothing but by his grace. Jesus made it plain. He says, you can do nothing without me. So where then is the boasting? If you've been given a gift like Kai, Kai's a humble man. Kai is a great gift for singing. If you've been given a gift like that, like Kai, then you have to say, I'm fortunate that God gave me this gift. It wasn't by my doing. It was his grace. You're not denying the gift or the value of the gift. You're saying, it wasn't because of me. It was because of him. He gave the gift. I'm thankful for the gift. But it's not me. It's him. There's but one throne in the human heart, and there's only one that can sit on that throne at a time. Who's sitting on yours? Is it self or is it God? If it's self, then your prayers will be directed to self. Just like the Pharisee. If self is on the throne of the heart, if I'm a big deal and it's all about me, then I get to pray to myself. And you know what? I 
have uh, every bit of faith in God's power to do everything, but I don't have a whole lot of faith in my power to do everything. I can't answer my own prayers, but God can. I need to get self off the throne. I need to put Jesus Christ on the throne. If Jesus is on the throne, then your prayers are directed to him. In that case, he hears your prayers if he's on the throne. If you're humbled before his throne, and as you pray, he says, I hear your words. Because his ears are open to the humble, but he resists the proud. You can have all kinds of faith. It says you can have all kinds of faith where you could move mountains. It says, but if you don't have any love, it won't profit you. You can have all kinds of faith, do all kinds of things. But if you don't have a spirit of humility, God says, I'm not even listening. But it was a really good prayer. Next. It was a really good prayer. It was really well structured. I based it on the word. And I had all kinds of faith, something would happen. God says, I'm still not listening. Don't listen to that. All right. So right now, I know that's a bit of a distraction. It's probably the devil's car himself. <laughs> right now, I would like us to bow our heads. We're going to pray even with the distraction. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to humble ourselves today because we want our faith to be effective. And right now, Lord Jesus, we take self off the throne of our heart. and We say all the glory be to Jesus Christ for everything we have and everything we can do. It's because of your power, not because of ours, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for your grace that, that suffices, Lord, when we come short. We thank you for your word, Lord, which sustains us, and for your faith, Lord, which gives us the power to receive your promises, Lord. But it's all because of you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have the worship team close in one song. Praise God.